Well, um, uh, this paper has been written with uh, Ferran in the last uh, four weeks, so it's a uh, work in progress, so your comments are very welcome. So the, what we do in, the, in this paper are three things. First, what we want to show is that there is a mismatch between the substantive definitions of democratic consolidation and the existing measures of consolidation, the second step will be proposing a new indicator of consolidation based on data from the Electoral Integrity Project. And the third step will be testing to what extent the, the existing mechanisms explaining consolidation can account for our measure of uh, consolidation. So let me start with two conventional definitions of democratic consolidation. The two definitions come from authors belonging to <coughs> different traditions. On the one hand, uh, Larry Diamond says the following, for a democracy to be consolidated, political actors have to obey the, the laws, the constitution, and norms, blah, blah, blah. And the second definition by Adam Chevorsky says that democracy is consolidated when both winners and losers comply with the current outcome, blah, blah, blah. blah. So, the crucial thing in our view of the definitions of democratic consolidation is the idea of uh, the self-enforcing nature of democracies. That is, the idea is that democracies are equilibrium because the best strategy for actors is respecting the rules of the game. I mean, democratic consolidation is not a matter of culture, it is not a matter of many other things, it's a matter of instrumental rationality, actors <coughs> behaving in the best way for satisfying their interests. For that reason, democracy is an equilibrium following the, the idea of Chivorsky and dictatorships are not. <coughs> so, again, uh, this idea of equilibrium, we think that it's the core of the definitions of democratic consolidation. However, we feel that the existing measures do not capture this idea, this essence of consolidation. So, Roughly speaking, there are three different approaches for uh, capturing measuring consolidation. On the one hand, we have the substantive approaches, and what this, uh, what this approach does is the following. In order to say that uh, democracy is consolidated, what we have to observe <coughs> is specific outcomes. For instance, we have to observe a robust political competition or a vibrant civic, uh, civic society. Uh, the problem with this approach is <coughs> Clear. I mean, uh, first, uh, there is a very clear uh, normative uh, view in this approach. It is not easy to define an outcome we have to observe. And as a consequence of this uh, normative conception, it's difficult to observe uh, an outcome that could travel across countries and time. And if you prefer, uh, we have here exactly the same problem when defining uh, democracies in, in substantive terms, as uh, Charles Dilley has shown several times. So this approach is not the best one, although it's quite popular. Second approach, the most popular one, is based on the prospective approach. The idea is that democracies are consolidated when um, they are stable. That is, consolidation is a synonymous of durability. And here there are two uh, popular uh, measures, the one and the two turnover test by Huntington, and uh, even more popular is the 12 year threshold by Kasilowski and Power. The idea is that we can assume that the democracy is, uh, is consolidated when the democracy has a minimum of 12 years of life. <coughs> that is, more than 12 years we can say that a uh, given democracy is consolidated, less than 12 years it is not. Again, uh, this approach is problematic, First of all, uh, it's uh, the idea of saying that uh, the threshold is 12 years is completely arbitrary. And, um, and the problem is that, apart from durability, we think that we have to observe some processes in order to say that democr uh, democracy is constant. <coughs> and the third approach, the most recent, the recent one, is uh, present in a paper by Slavic. And what this guy says is, okay, given that it's so difficult capturing um, consolidation, the best thing we can do is infer whether a democracy is consolidated or not, instead of trying to measure consolidation. 
So there is a very sophisticated statistical approach in order to determine threshold, blah, 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 blah. But at the end of the day, we're not sure about what's going on here, not sure why. Uh, it seems that the state or SPSS is taking decisions about when a democracy is conciliated or not. So it's to some extent this type of approach is a black box. So what we suggest is that a good measure of consolidation, in our view, has to do different things. First, it has to capture the essence of consolidation. <coughs> and in our, our view, the essence is uh, the concept of democracy as an equilibrium. Second, uh, consolidation should be understood as a continuous variable, not as a dichotomous one. For instance, when we use a 12-year uh, threshold, what we are doing is putting together, for instance, the United States and Ghana, given that both democracies have more than 12 years of uh, durability, so both are the same, so we think they are not. And on the other hand, Cuba and Paraguay are the same. They are not consolidated democracies, but they are not the same, of course. So we think that apart from including democracies, the consolidated and non-consolidated democracies, we should include non-democracies, because it's a way to maximize the variability in the variable of consolidation, apart from many other properties, like um, increasing the number of observations, uh, avoiding biases, well, I will come back to this point. And third, uh, the problem when using the existing measures is that it is not possible to determine to what extent the three mechanisms that I will present in a minute can account for democ democratic consolidation. On the one hand, there is a very clear tautology. For instance, um, one of the arguments says, okay, in order to have a consolidated democracy, we need free and fair elections. But obviously, uh, there are no consolidated democracies without free and fair elections, so it is it's not possible to determine the impact of this variable. So it's a clear tautology here in our view. And second, there is a bias in the sense that we are um, not taking into account the goal variability of the variables when focusing the attention on consolidated and non-consolidated democracies. For that reason, we think that we have to include non-democracies in the analysis, just to avoid these tautological explanations and uh, reducing uh, the problem of reducing the variability of the variable. So what we propose is a new indicator <coughs> of consolidation based on data from the electoral integrity project. As you know, and if not, Frank will explain in detail the, uh, the, the description of the, of the project. The EAP project is based on information from expert surveys in all countries in which elections have uh, taken place in the last uh, one year and a half. So in the, in the question, there is a very nice question capture, capturing exactly what we want to capture. As you can see, we have this question. Do you agree or disagree with the following statement? All these candidates challenge the results, strongly disagree, disagree. So, this is exactly what the definition of democracy in the terms of Chevorsky says. So this is clearly a, an approach to capture equilibrium or the self-enforcing nature of democracy. So, so what we are going to do is create an indicator going from 5 to 1. So the value 5 will mean that the democracy has the highest, the, uh, the, uh, the, the highest level of consolidation <coughs> While, while one is a minimum value of the variable. Although the variable has only five possible values, given that we have many experts <coughs> from every country, at the end of the day, we have a continuous value because we have averages for every country. So this will be our measure of consolidation. Exactly this question for 64 countries in the last uh, year and a half. So in order to, sh to, to show you the, the reliability of our measure, let me present this, uh, this first uh, so what we are doing here is testing or showing the correlation between the 12-year threshold and our measure of consolidation. So here we have divided our sample of democracies in terms of having less or more than 12 years of, uh, of life, and here we have our value. So for non-consolidated democracies, that is democracies or counties with less than 12 years, this is the distribution, and this one for consolidated democracy. So as you can see, there are clear differences between the two measures. So it seems that, as you can see, our measure is highly correlated with uh, the 12-year threshold. The correlation is 0.61. It's 
statistically significant at the 1%, but there is an overlap between the two uh, box plot, and there are some countries which are strange, let's say. So as you can see here, there are three countries which score below the average in our measure, but according to the 12-year threshold, the three countries are democracies. These are Ghana, Micronesia, and Bulgaria. And on the other hand, there are several countries doing very well in our measure and not so well in the 12-year threshold of consolidation. So it seems that we are going in the right direction in the sense that both measures are highly correlated, but they are not capturing exactly the same. So the second table is still more clarifying. What we are doing here is simply showing the statistics, uh, distinguishing between the two types of democracies according to the 12-year uh, duration indicator. So as you can see, the mean in our five-point uh, uh, score is almost four for consolidated democracies according to this index, but only 2.17 for non-consolidated democracies. So the difference is statistically significant. So again, both measures are highly correlated. But it's very interesting seeing that there are differences within groups and the standard deviation for non-consolidated democracies is even higher than for consolidated democracies, even when the mean is much lower. So this means, in our view, that the 12-year threshold is a better measure for uh, stable uh, democracies than for uh, defining new non-consolidated democracies. So there is noise here, as you can see. And as you can see on the other hand, we have countries doing very well in our uh, measure, but they are in the category of democracies or countries with less than 20 years of democracy. So the two measures are strongly correlated, but they are not captured in the So uh, the next step in our empirical analysis is uh, exploring to what extent the three mechanisms of explaining the survival of democracies. Uh, well, we explore uh, the impact of these three mechanisms using our measure of democracy. So we cannot use the 12 year threshold of democracy because of the problem of tautology. So, in general terms, there are three arguments explaining why democracies survive once they are established. The first one is, uh, is what we call the, lo the loser fidelity argument. This argument uh, comes from Cheborsky. The argument says the following. Um, when, the, when there is a, a, an electoral defeat, the loser has to take a decision whether running again or not respecting the result and fighting in order to obtain the power, not following the rules. So the argument is that for the, for the loser, it's crucial having a good chance of winning, of becoming the winner in the future. And in order to have this chance, we need free and fair elections. Free and fair elections make uh, possible that the loser today could be the winner tomorrow. So this is what, according to the first Cheborsky, Cheborsky in Democracy in the Market, explain why democracies uh, survive. The second <coughs> argument is the opportunity to cause argument, and uh, this idea is based on economic development. <coughs> the idea is that the richer countries are, or the richer democracies are, the more stable democracies are. The idea is that there is a, a gap between the income for losers in democracies and for winners in case of uh, a coup d'etat. So the higher uh, or the more important economic development, the higher the gap, so democracies could be much more stable. And the third argument is a new one based on the idea of the salvation argument. The idea is that when there are elections, the loser has to take the decision of respecting or, or not the, ele the, the election result. And uh, the point is that when the support for the winner and the loser is balanced, the loser can interpret the election in the sense of saying, okay, I have very good chances of winning a possible, a potential fight as a civil war, if you prefer. So when the support for the, for the two main parties is unbalanced, democracies are much more stable. So we are going to test these three mechanisms using our data set and our indicator of democracy. So these are the definitions of the variables. First, we have 64 countries, democracies and non-democracies. Our dependent variable is our measure of uh, consolidation, going from 1 to 5. 5 uh, means 
that democracy has the highest possible level of consolidation, one is the minimum, and the key independent variable capture the three previous mechanisms. On the one hand, free and fair elections is captured with uh, free and house values. Uh, the economic development is captured with the love of uh, per capita income. And finally, the idea of whether the support of the two main parties is balanced or not is captured with this uh, equation, this formula. So imagine that there is a tie between the first and the second party. The difference would be zero, zero divided by 100, zero, one minus zero, one. So the higher the value, uh, the more competitive the election was. So what we expect is that the impact of uh, free elections should be positive on uh, democratic consolidation, the impact of per capita impo income should be positive, while the impact of political competition should be negative. Additionally, we have two controls, education and the lack of knowledge. <coughs> Even that we have only 64 observations, we are risk averse in the sense of including many variables, although we have tested many others, like uh, for instance, ethnic and linguistic fragmentation, and given that they were not significant, uh, they are not included in the model. So, let me show you the results. Uh, the estimates, uh, we, have a, we have run a robust regression, given that there are two outliers, uh, Iran and Rwanda, but the results are pretty similar when we run a non-robust regression, or simply we remove the two outliers from the models. So, in the first model, what we do is test the first argument, the loser friendly argument, and as you can see, uh, when elections are free, the higher the value the, uh, of this variable, the higher the value is in our indicator of democracy, and the variable is statistically significant at the 1%. So it seems that having free elections is crucial. And when we pay attention to the controls, both uh, behave as expected, education has a positive impact, that is, uh, the, the greater the percentage of people with the uh, university studies, the more stable democracies are, while the impact of population is negative. Uh, population, in our view, is capturing uh, uh, heterogeneity, and as you know, this variable is uh, negatively correlated to the concentration. And the pay is quite good. So in the second model, we replace free elections with economic development, and as you can see, the, or the, um, the, the variable behaves as expected, the impact is positive, but significant at the 5%, not at the 1%. And the fit of the model is worse. The controls have the same impact, but they are not significant. And in the third model, we replace income with political competition. The impact is negative, as expected, but it is not statistically significant, while the controls are now significant with the same impact. So in the, first, in the fourth model, we combine the three mechanisms. And as you can see, free election is positive and significant the one percent. The same with political competition, negative and significant, but economic development is not significant, and the controls are not. So it seems that when we put together the three mechanisms, elections and competition make a difference, but economic de development does not. And in the final model, what we do is running an interaction between free elections and income. So the argument, for instance, uh, according to Chaworski or according to Slovic, is that democratic consolidation is much uh, probable is in, in those uh, countries with uh, a very important economic development. So income should make a difference only for democracy. Or on the other hand, Chaworski says that um, economic development uh, reinforces democracies while we can dictatorships. So when we run the, the interaction, as you can see, the interaction is significant at the 1%, while the coefficient for political competition is literally the same. And the fit clearly improves. So it seems that this is the best specification, and the result is, OK, free elections matter, political competition matters, and income or economic development is all of, is only important when we have free elections. Well, given that interactions are not easy to interpret, now we present two figures to represent the percent. First, we showed that the impact of 
um, economy development is only significant when elections are quite free, that is for values above 4.5. As you can see, the impact is not significant in this area, given this, that the zero is included in the interval of confidence. And here we present uh, the impact of the interaction. And uh, we are interested in, in the value of seven, for instance. This means that elections uh, have the highest possible value of freedom. And as you can see, when we go from five to six, or to seven or to eight, in terms of the lack of per capita income, the values of the value of our dependent variable increases. However, here, for uh, when in those countries in which elections are not free at all, uh, income does not make any difference. So this uh, graph, this figure is captured in the interaction. So the conclusion is that it seems that the, the two of the th uh, two of the three mechanisms are important by themselves. Why the third one, economic development, plays a role only when there is an interaction with with the uh, elections. So. Just to conclude, let me present the conclusions. The first one is that we think that we have shown that there is a mismatch between substantive discussions and empirical indicators. So uh, this is clearly a problem in this literature. Second, we have proposed a new indicator of democratic <coughs> consolidation based on post-election reactions, exactly what the definitions of democracy as uh, equilibria uh, say. And finally, we have uh, found very strong support for the subversion and the separation and the loser free and the argument, but we only have a partial uh, support for the economy development argument. It is that economy development makes a difference only when elections are free. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much.